And good morning and welcome to this virtual bridge session. Uh, today we have with us uh, Irene, who's going to be talking about uh, digital inequality. She's a PhD student at the University of the West of Scotland uh, and also director of More Collective. But uh, there's no better person to introduce herself than herself. So I'll shut up there and hand over to her. So hello, everybody. Um, I'm not even sure if I'm the right person to uh, be um, joining in today, but I used to work with just for a wee while. Um, so I served my time with the organisation and it was really nice to hear from Jason recently. Um, I have been working in the field of digital inequality for uh, 10 years now, I guess, maybe a wee bit longer. Um, and we have worked for various charities over that period and over the last three or four years we set up an organisation ourselves called More Collective and the way we work is we work in partnership with um, charities across the third sector in Scotland and help them come to grips with digital inequality, what that means, what they can do about it and I'm also um, pulled into a PhD um, with the University of the West of Scotland looking primarily at digital inequality and how that impacts and what we can do about it. Um, again, very much from a sort of social justice perspective and it's a participatory action research approach I'm taking for anyone that cares about that kind of thing, um, which pretty much means that I spend all my time doing and what little time I have I find myself just freaking out that I'm not actually writing anything about the stuff I'm doing. So that seems to be a very common participatory reaction research approach is that you get your kind of your you're super aware and then apparently the output is poor poor um, but I'm um, old enough now that I'm not stressing too much about that I'm hoping something's going to miraculously happen in terms of that. Um, for the research back, which may or may not interest you, I am uh, working really heavily with an organisation called Simon Community, which works with people experiencing homelessness in Scotland. Um, and we are working on a dead exciting digital inclusion project where we train up um, members of Simon Community staff um, to help them with their own digital skills so that they can help other folk. I'm also working with a charity called Neighbourhood Networks that works exclusively with folk with intellectual disabilities and starting to um, really look at how issues affect them and what we can do about it. So looking at peer support models within that. But I also have my fingers in all manners of ridiculous pies all over the place. What's happened in the last wee while is that um, digital inclusion from being a sort of a niche subject is now like everyone's bag. That's what's happened in the last two months is that suddenly everybody, so we've been yakking on about it for a decade and all of a sudden everyone cares. Everybody's going, yeah, 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 yeah digital inclusion, that's what we need to do right now. So there's massive work being done across Scotland at um, terrifying speed in terms of reaching people who are digitally excluded, um, especially by the third sector. Scottish Government has also taken on a massive piece of work called Connecting Scotland. We are, um, I get mixed up about, see when I'm saying we, sometimes it's me, sometimes it's more collective, sometimes it's a sort of general we, um, but more collective has been taken on as a delivery partner for Connecting Scotland, which is um, a really, really very significant um, investment by Scottish Government, looking at 50,000 people across Scotland who are going to receive digital devices and um, those digital devices will have connectivity and they will also have skills development work built in alongside that and that's a piece of work that started we've run the pilot phase of that and we're going to be running that um for the next six months the first folk being identified at that uh, um for that project are coming through um uh, the shielding group we're looking at primarily so we're trying to cross-reference data sets um we're working with Carnegie Trust, who are very experienced in the field of digital inequality as well, um, and trying to cross-reference data sets to work out who's digitally excluded and who's shielding. It's quite a bit of a mess in terms of data, and I hate data stuff, so I kind of just chuck a wee thing in every so often. So I thought today, um, I've got 20 minutes left, is that right? 
That's about right, isn't it? Um, so I thought what we would do is we would try and do a mass kahoot at the moment to get our heads in the game a little bit um, around digital inequality and such statistics. You're probably familiar with them. The stats, just so I know, there'll be some data heads in the audience there. I pulled the stats heavily from um, Lloyd's statistics, the Lloyd's Consumer Index, which informs um, the sector quite heavily, actually, even though it's led by a bank. So I know that you'll have a bunch of feelings about how those statistics are influenced, but I use that and I'm using WHO as a global inequality discussion. So I am now going to try and share my screen and we're going to give the Kahoot thing a little go. So can I see a quick show of hands, just the actual hands, how many folk have used Kahoot? Oh, there's a few. So there's enough. So if you find it too stressful getting on to Kahoot, don't worry, just like participate in your head, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm just going to pull up the Kahoot screen just now and hopefully you'll be able to see it. Um, uh, this should work, but the only problem is, oh no, I can still see you all. Uh, that's great news. So we're going to press play on this now. <coughs> Present. Mm, so this should work. So what you're going to do now is you are going to um, join a Kahoot quiz. So you can either go to the Kahoot website um, and put in this game pin, num pin number or um, go into the app if you've already downloaded the app. And if you can put your name there so that I can see and then we can talk to a decent number of people join in, we'll, we'll go. So we've got our first player in, James. Marianne, I like it. This is where we decide if people are putting in nicknames or not. Joy. So I don't know how many people are on the call. Jason, can you come off mute and tell me? Just so I know what's a yeah, critical there are mass. 37, 37 people. Oh, 37, right. So once we get to about 20, I'll just crack on. So if you're wanting to play, get your names in just now. And if you can we'll take see. slightly less time than you were suggesting to allow people questions, that would be wonderful. Okay, I'll do I'll do my best to fly through it. Okay. I love it. Slightly less time. Right. So let's get going. I'm just going to shrink you all down just now. So we're just going to start. So just 10 questions. So let's get going. What percentage of the global population is currently using the internet? Not currently, is using the internet. Are there prizes? No, I'm sorry, there's no prizes, unfortunately. So the right answer is 51%. Um, so a lot of people have, um, in fact, no one actually got that one right. So it's 51%. So it's just over half of the global population. And it's quite clear where that um, population will be settled, mostly in developed countries. And we're going to come on to that as well. And that imp impacts heavily on access to education. So when we're thinking about um, half half of the folk in the world don't have access to the internet and aren't able to use it, that means they're not also not able to access any of the online learning opportunities or um, education more widely through that. Um, so Karine has uh, gone straight in there. I don't know why she's gone in when everybody's on zero, but it's filled Karine up as number one. Question number two, what percentage of the population of Africa is online? Hmm. So the right answer, folk, we're pretty confident in this, it's 39%. What we also know is that the cost of um, connection in, um, in developing countries is much higher. So you also, so the, 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 when you, you're paying for a very poor connectivity in, in countries um, across the world, so the, the countries that have the lowest level of digital engagement also have the highest level of uh, cost related to data and the poorest quality for that. Um, so it's a kind of further layer on top of that. 
Um, so who's gone in? Oh, Jason, class is on the buzzer there. Nice. Right, next one. Question three, what percentage of the European population is online? So that's us starting to narrow it down a wee bit here. So the right answer here is um, 88%. Um, so it's a really significant part of the European population. So again, when we're thinking about a fraction overseas students, it's really, it's really interesting to reflect on your student demographic, I think, and consider to what extent things are being affected by the, the digital element there. So 88%, right, next. Who's gone up there? Kenji. Oh, <laughs> it's battle of the admin here, it feels like a little bit. Right, next one. Question number four. 58% of men globally use the internet. This is a great question. Look at the quality. What percentage of women? Again, um, women are underrepresented in, in terms of internet use. So it's only 48% women globally use the internet. So again, all we're seeing here, so this quiz isn't, it's not gonna blow your mind. All you're seeing is the sort of replication of inequalities that exist. So societal inequalities replicating um, internet inequality. And that has a really massive impact when we're talking about the internet as this potentially massive leveler because that's absolutely not what it's doing. So Jason snuck up again. James in second place. Come on, James, I'm rooting for you. Allison, Allison, come on. Come on further up. Question number five. What percentage of the UK population lack essential digital skills? <clears throat> So the right answer is indeed 22%. So loads of you got this right. And um, the Essential Digital Skills Framework is one that has been um, agreed by both Scottish and UK government and identifies a range of digital skills in a range of categories. So looking at communication, transaction, um, ability to create and engage. So there's, there's different categories of essential digital skills. And what happens is a lot of people present with some elements but don't have um, all of the digital skills that they need to participate meaningfully in both society and employment and therefore education as well. So 22% is a fair whack of the population. So Jason's hanging on there. John Ells comes sneaking up the back there. Well done. Question number six. What percentage of those without digital skills are under 60 years of age? So the right answer is actually 48%. It used to be when, when I started work in the field of digital inequality, people would always say, oh, you know, it's just older folk that don't have digital skills. And pretty soon, this is actual conversations that we had with local authorities. Pretty soon, you know, all those old ones will actually be dead. So you don't need to worry about digital inequality. But actually what we're seeing is, is not that at all. We're seeing um, that, as I've said already, societal um, influences widely impact on um, digital skills. So it's not just to do with older people. Although really interesting in terms of the current COVID-19 situation, there has been a massive focus on older people um, in terms of reaching them. Because I think, um, despite statistical evidence to, to the opposite, I think people still continue to have this perception that it is older people that are most affected. And that, in fact, is not the case at all. So, James has snuck up. Julie's come waking up there, which is super exciting. Well done. And it says up six places, and he's the highest climber, so hang on in there. 
Next one. Question number seven. What percentage of Scottish benefits claimants are offline? Hmm. So the right answer, everybody has gone higher and that is in no way surprising. In fact, we've had stand-up arguments with uh, colleagues from Citizens Advice Bureau who have said actually uh, the statistics are far higher than that. But if you think these are, the, so offline means absolutely no ability whatsoever to claim their benefits in a system that's now 100% online. So um, universal credit is the way that people are entitled to claim benefits, but one in, almost one in five people now can't claim the benefits they need to put food on their table. So I still think, even though it's at the lowest end of that spectrum, that is still a horrific amount of people that are being pushed into poverty by a, a digital system there. So next one, where are we? What? It's quite a quiet leaderboard here, James, holding on. Question number eight, what percentage of off-life that adults are from a low-income family? <laughs> a little over five minutes left, I've been just so you know. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> So the percentage of offline adults that are from a low income family, it's 47% of them are from a low income household. And again, what we're seeing, especially in terms of coronavirus and the impact on education immediately, is that low income, and if you think about student population as well, those students who are from low income households, who have maybe returned to the family home, won't, um, won't have digital access um, in their homes. Um, young people of school age who don't have support from, in the Highlands Council area, we're lucky enough that um, all of the kids have um, been given digital devices by the local authority, but those devices won't have connectivity. And um, we know from research that connectivity is a massive problem, almost more so than access to the device. So when working with people experiencing homelessness, a lot of people experiencing homelessness, the, the vast majority actually, will have access to a digital device, but they will not have connectivity to match that. Um, so that, that's an issue there. Um, Next question. Ooh, what's happened here? Kenji snuck up. James is hanging on. Next. Question nine out of ten. What percentage of offline adults in the UK have a disability? Mm -hmm. This interestingly, this statistic's gone down over the last year. Mm -hmm. So the right answer now is 32%. Last year it had been 48% and they sort of looked a wee bit more at the statistics for that. What we know from praxis is that one of the reasons um, people with a disability quite often don't use the internet um, is because they've had a bad experience sort of five, six, seven years ago where they weren't appropriately supported with accessibility tools and don't realise that the accessibility tools have changed massively in terms of ease of access. We also know that third sector organisations and educational specialists quite often struggle with accessibility tools themselves. So places where people would get support around um, the digital skills that they need to improve accessibility, um, those places quite often feel anxious about providing support. What we also know is that for um, certain groups of people, um, young people with uh, um, an intellectual disability, for instance, um, all of the research shows and practice shows that those who are providing support, family, carers, um, support staff, will all choose to keep that young person offline to reduce um, their vulnerability or a perception that keeping them offline will reduce vulnerability and that being online therefore increases vulnerability and that's a piece of work that I'm working through quite a lot and it's a conversation that comes up all the time. 
not just in terms of intellectual disability, another group that's really negatively affected around this question of vulnerability are young people who are care experienced, quite often have had very restricted internet use because um, people are trying to keep them safe by just keeping them offline altogether. So Joyce comes sneaking up here, James hanging on, and Toots is the highest climber. Right, last question. What percentage disadvantaged young people have low levels of netiquette? That's the idea of online etiquette. So it's about this kind of idea of digital understanding and how to make the internet work for you. This was part of the Carnegie report. <clears throat> The right answer is 40% and loads of people have got that right and the reason this particular question, it's a daft sounding question, but the reason it's really, really interesting is a lot of the academic research now is starting to focus heavily on this idea of digital capital. So if young people are presenting with some elements of digital skills, what we see is that young people who are from advantaged backgrounds are more likely to be able to use the way in an, it, it, use the internet in a way that um, is advantageous to them. They're more likely to be able to access educational opportunities, for instance, whereas young people who are from disadvantaged backgrounds are not going to be able to um, develop their skills in a way that enhances their social capital. So let's just see who the winner is here on the digital inequality podium. Benji's in third place. Number two, James. Oh, who's snuck in at number one then? <clears throat> Julie! I am absolutely delighted. That's great. So I'm just gonna just come off and stop the noise of Kahoot in the background. So I have, um, weirdly, I have the Kahoot noise banging in my head in the background there. Um, so my research, that, that's kind of my research in a, a, a nutshell, is it's kind of um, looking at digital inequality more broadly, but I'm very, very much interested in that Scottish context and what we're doing about it. I'm interested in how it's impacting research at all levels. Um, across the board. So I work with students at UWS as well, trying to get them to think when they're doing a, a research, des um, research design about thinking about digital inequality, when they're kind of gallantly entering the field of social sciences and thinking about what they're going to do. I'm trying constantly to be chipping away at the vital importance of digital inequality. So I really kind of take up the opportunity to yak on about it any chance I get. So I've only got three minutes for questions, but maybe Jason will let me have a, an extra few. I'm Who's sure got any questions? Indeed, indeed. Uh, so, um, well, thank you very much for that and uh, some very interesting messages there. Uh, very briefly, I'll start off oh, with- Gina's one. there. Oh, Gina, you're <laughs> actually there. You did write that report. No, that's embarrassing if Gina's there in case I got something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, my question is, is there anything immediately, uh, you've obviously worked um, in the education context and studying in it, um, is there anything, what, what are the messages from your research that we might take into account when we're looking at further and higher education? I think the kind of key messages are making sure that when you are considering online learning platforms, for instance, that not everyone will have access to that in the way. In the current COVID-19 situation, what we're finding is that a lot of um, students in particular who are returning home and there's this assumption that they can then join in if they've been on campus and in accommodation they're then returning home and don't have access to connectivity so it's about kind of thinking about that offline message really and I think in terms of supporting students to really engage with that issue at all levels of their study, um, especially within kind of social sciences or research design that they're thinking about the impact of digital inequality really any, anywhere you go. Thank you very much. We've had a question asking about how recent these stats are. Yeah, uh, last last year's the twenty the twenty nineteen or the may no the the twenty nineteen ones. I'm fairly certain. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you had a comment in there from Lee Wilson. Um, Lee, would you like to unmute and uh, explain a little bit about your context and how it relates to you? Where is Lee? 
No, I'm, yeah, it's I'm not, not popping in. No, I'm so, not. Um, oh, it had to jump to across to another call. Oh, he's jumped across. Oh, okay. It's just, 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 it was just a nice comment. But um, John has said, yeah. do we have any insight into what students have access to the right hardware? Um, if it's hard to tell John whether you're talking about, um, are you talking about the actual devices? Well, let John. Um, <coughs> try and, uh, yeah, there we go. Yes, the actual devices, and part of it is the students have an access. Sometimes the family has access. Yeah. The <coughs> so what we know is that um, people from disadvantaged backgrounds um, uh, with socioeconomic issues going on in the background are more likely to be on mobile devices first. So again, that's really important to build into consideration if you're looking at what learning platforms to think about is do they work on a mobile device? Because quite often, um, students students who are struggling with a number of other issues will only have access to a, a mobile device in particular. In terms of what actual platforms, um, again, Android, I would say, is much more across the board. So if you're starting to look at um, implementation, then, um, you know, starting off thinking about um, Apple devices is probably the wrong way to go, because again, they'll have no peer support for that. And, um, you know, it, it's it's just beyond the realm. So some of the stuff we've been looking at with homeless people is we're actually looking at the, the lowest point of entry for folk experiencing homelessness. So the pilot that we are working on just now is actually using a sort of wee Motorola device. And we are looking at embedding elements of education within that because another sort of relative statistic or relative, uh, not statistic, but another sort of relative demographic is the correlation between um, literacy and digital literacy so if someone is struggling with literacy issues they're also tending to be struggling with digital literacy alongside that so in terms of hardware there's no clear answer other than um, mobile devices are more dominant but the actual device um, itself there's there's not a kind of clear thing but the device because it used to I, again even working within the homelessness sector we we're constantly told that, oh, you know, my client doesn't have access to a device. But I did a lot of work at the, the drop in, in Edinburgh, and actually, that doesn't bear out from my practical experience and also from wider research. The access to a device won't be the same one week on week because it might be sold on by the next time you see them, but they will have access. So we are always looking at cloud based solutions for that demographic group so that if they if they lose the device they can get straight back into the same stuff and that's been a change in thinking for staff as well who are used to using platforms like Microsoft where it's all closed down and costed and trying to get staff third sector organizations educational practitioners to think about Google where it's more open I know there's privacy issues and everything and and that's all good and well but actually what you're doing is creating a commonality that can be picked up repeatedly, regardless of device. And I think that's absolutely vital for people. Thank you. And you've got uh, quite a lot of praise for use of Kahoot. You're the first person to use Kahoot, uh, I think, um, across these sessions. So well done for that. Uh, someone's asking for the name of the report <laughs> then, and that's something that we can add to the description. Yep. Yep. I'll send that on. I'll send on a couple of useful reports that might be of interest to you. And certainly, and, given, yep. well, given we, that Gina's on the call, there'll be a fair bit of Carnegie stuff. We won't dwell on Gina getting the Kahoot question wrong about the stat that she had in her own report that she wrote. But anyway, uh, just as a final one for in, in half a minute, what is the key takeaway for policy and colleges about developing digital capability from Walter? I think for me, Walter, it is about tying in with so not just thinking about it in the organizational context but thinking about that kind of societal context more widely so i think setting stuff in line with the essential digital skills framework because that's certainly a piece of work that the third sector is using so support organizations are using scottish government is using but it's a piece of work that's quite often lost so i think in terms of developing digital capability it's looking at the wider holistic approach to digital skills we also know that <clears throat> encouraging people with things that they are most interested in will lead to transfer of skills but you guys know that already like that's that's not rocket science but it's something that also quite often gets lost so i think set it in line with wider discussions on digital inequality so when you're looking at digital capability 
set it in context, context for not just education, think about it so sort of broadly. The bigger picture are always good. Uh, with that, Irene, I'm going to draw the recorded session to a close. Can I thank you ever so much for the presentation and those facts and You're something very to think about? Thank you. <laughs>